the Snapmaker U1 is the tool changer 3D printer that offers the best bang for your buck. Well, apart from the top cover, which isn't exactly cheap. So today we test two printable community versions to see how they perform. The Snapmaker U1. I'm still loving it, and in fact it's become a go-to 3D printer for me in the studio. So let's recap how things started with the U1, how it's going now, and how we can further improve it. I first covered the Snapmaker U1 with a first impressions video. And initially there were a couple of problems, including a broken wire for the filament runout and the default coordinates for tool 4 being off by about a millimeter, making selecting it unreliable. Fortunately, fixing both of those problems was something I could do myself, and they were both straightforward. And from that point, the performance of the printer has been fantastic and it's become one of my favorites. Typically, I have loaded up a combination of TPU and rigid filaments, and you can use the U1 to do true multi-material prints, as I did exclusively in this recent guide. Rather than Snapmaker Orca, I use Vanilla Orca Slicer. This means that, unlike with Bamboo Lab printers, I can operate the machine completely locally, using the fluid web interface on my local network. The only thing missing is the webcam camera feed. However, that is still available through the app, as is the rest of the Bamboo Lab-like cloud experience for those who still want it. In summary, I'm getting quality prints and a nice user interface like you'd get from Bamboo Lab, but utilizing software and firmware that's completely open source. And as a true tool changer, the changes are lightning fast without the delay and purge waste like you get in the Bamboo Lab H2C. One limitation as tested, however, is the U1's inability to print filaments that warp. This simply being because the top of the printer is completely open, whereas filaments that warp need an enclosed chamber. Enter the optional top cover that should fix this problem. At the moment, it's a 149 US dollar optional add-on, with the final price increasing to 249. And I'm not going to lie, that does sound expensive, but we do have to remember that not only is it injection molded and designed to fit the machine perfectly, but it also has an inbuilt air purification system with HEPA filter and activated carbon. But at the moment, it's just not available, so it's not really an option for anyone. Fortunately, the community has come to the rescue, and today I present two options. One is exceedingly cheap and easy to prep, and the other is more complex, but does offer a lot more customization. We're going to start with a simple option, and that's the Snapmaker U1 top cover modding using an IKEA Samler tub by Beaverworks. This one is found on Maker World, and there's not a great deal of documentation because it doesn't really need it. There's only a single component to buy, and that's that IKEA tub. I was able to get it in Australia for only $11. And just take care that you get the right size. It's the 45 litre version that we want. Any of the others won't fit. Apart from that, we're just printing files, and if you do want to do any remixes, there's now step files available to make that task easier. I imported these parts one at a time, saving a Project 3MF, and the only print changes I made were turning off a brim and upping the wall loops and the infill for strength. As you can see, no parts are too big to be printed on the U1 itself. I chose white PET G as my filament, which can handle the chamber temperature without any issues, and you should be able to produce all of the parts from a single spool of filament. For this version, you'll have a handy tub to collect the pieces in until you're ready to assemble. There's upper and lower pieces that are easy to match up due to their thickness, and we simply press fit the dovetail joints together. If you're unsure how they go, just line them up with the tub to get the correct proportions. This piece was the only one that I found tight, and I overcame this with a block of scrap wood and a rubber mallet, mating the two sides together carefully. At this point, we're about a third of the way through the assembly already. The other set of pieces, once again, is obvious in terms of how they go together, and once again, in less than two minutes, you should have the pieces together and ready to install. The next step is probably the only place where you can go wrong, and it's removing the two bolts at the back of the printer where each tool is wired up. This will allow you to unplug the USB-C connector and uncouple the large PTFE tube, and where I went wrong was forgetting to unload the filament first, so I had to put it back together, do this, and then repeat the steps. With everything disconnected, we take the larger of the two pieces and lower it down from the top around the umbilicals. It's simply a press fit, and for me it was nice and snug. If we look from the top, we can see that there's still enough room for the tool connectors and the future expansion ports. We can also see at the front that there's cutouts to not obscure the Snapmaker logo or the touchscreen. The next step is to lower the second piece from above, once again clearing the umbilicals, placing it roughly in position for now, and then preparing the connecting pins, of which there's two versions. 
Referencing the diagram on Maker World, we can see the ones with the skinny top go along the back and also on the opposing front corners. I guess at this stage you could use some glue to keep them permanently in position, but for me these were a snug enough fit that I didn't worry about it. In fact some of them needed a tap with the mallet to get the head the whole way down. We install the other slim pins into the front right and left corners, and then the remaining thicker pins along each side. Our next step is to reinsert and put back the screws for each tool head connector. And visibility is a fair bit more difficult now, but if you are getting stuck, you can momentarily lift up the lid to get access to the connector and make sure it's aligned before doing the screws. That's all of the printed parts in place and only one step remains. Placing the IKEA tub over the top to seal the chamber. And that's all that happens, it just rests on top and I guess if you were worried about it vibrating, which wasn't a problem for me, you could always add some foam tape to help the seal. The appearance of the completed mod is a storage tub upside down on top of a printer. And some people will care about this a lot and others won't mind at all. It's going to come down to taste. Access remains fantastic as when we remove the tub, it's almost the same as before. Option one down, so let's look at option two. Option two is called the Snapmaker U1 Top Hat by Serene. And this one is posted on printables with a duplicate companion page found on GitHub as well. In my opinion, this version gives a much more factory-like appearance but it becomes evident as soon as you start scrolling through the instructions that this is a lot more complicated to build and also requires a lot more parts. In sourcing those parts, we have two options. Not available when I started is a kit from Blue Rolls. And for 75 US dollars, this includes all of the flat plastic panels, the wooden dowel pins and various tapes. The only thing you'll still need are the printed parts. Instead of yourself sourcing, you can scroll down to the bill of materials and get the details and quantities of everything else required. I attempted to get everything from our local hardware store Bunnings with limited success, so I'd recommend instead shopping online. The next thing to understand here is that there's multiple versions that you can print, and what you're seeing here and what I did was make the original version. There's also a version that's entirely printed, not needing any plexiglass, a box style shape that means all of the clear panels are rectangular, a big slope version, a hybrid version with minimal openings, and there's also a version with the parts split into smaller pieces if you're working with a smaller printer. And because of all these variants, the documentation does become quite convoluted in places. It's a limitation of printables for complex projects. But typically, if you scroll to the version you're after, you'll find the relevant information. Again, I prepared this one in Orca Slicer, importing the components one at a time. And as you can see, the biggest ones will just fit on the U1 bed. Like the first version, my filament of choice once again was White Pet G from X3D. And unfortunately, as I discovered the hard way, You'll need a bit more than one complete one kilo roll of filament to print these pieces. For the parts with the skinnier sections, I employed a brim, but left this turned off for the chunkier bits. There is a little bit of post-processing to do for these parts, and anywhere you had a brim, it needs to be peeled off with a nice clean edge. Some of the chunkier pieces also had inbuilt support material built right into the model. In my case, it was a piece of cake to simply put a tool in between to break the seal, and then this peeled off cleanly. From memory, there are four components that have these sacrificial pieces. These pieces go together like a jigsaw using wooden dowel pieces to connect them. But I avoided this, keeping everything 3D printed with a custom dowel design. It's 40 millimeters long and slightly oversized in diameter, but with a gap in the middle so it can flex shut. And there's a flat surface on the top and bottom so they don't fall off the bed. With these, putting the frame together was like doing a 3D jigsaw puzzle. I didn't need it, but you could use the reference images on the website to work out which part goes where. Previewing installation, the frame just goes over the top of everything, sitting on top of the printer. But there is one component we need to add to make sure it sits without wobbling about. And that's the four printed feet that interface with the rubber stoppers in each corner of the frame. These are a simple interference fit and allow the lid to be lifted off after it's been installed. At this stage, it's probably best not to do glue as you might need some adjustment after adding the plastic panels. If you're using pre-made panels and after installing there's gaps between the printed pieces, there is a step-by-step -step sequence for measuring the gap and printing spaces to suit. In my case, as I was making the clear panels myself, I did apply glue, securing the frame in stages using weights to hold it in place. In my case, I made the panels myself on my laser cutter and table saw, taking the dimensions from the website, transferring them to a 2D sketch in Onshape, and then exporting that as a DXF, and then importing this file into Lightburn. I initially cut a cardboard prototype to test the fitment, making necessary adjustments and then returning to the laser to cut the final panel from this tinted acrylic. But despite my care, this aspect didn't go so well. 
and that's because the plastic I already had sitting on the shelf was thicker than I remembered. So I had to make my panels from bits and bobs I had lying around. All of my rectangular panels I simply did on the table saw, trimming them down until they were the perfect fit. Normally, once the spacing was sorted, you would lay down the double-sided tape along the inside of the frame before putting in any panels that go vertically. And for those that sit on top, you would put down the foam backing as these panels are held in place by gravity. That's what these finger cutouts are for, allowing easy access to pull the top panels on and off. As for me, I am just wedging them in place for now. That's because of the materials I used. I have some random holes, so these will need remaking. The thickness of my panels is also inconsistent, which means they don't sit as nicely as they could. I'm also most likely going to switch to one of the one-piece versions, just so I can eliminate the visual joins, and get the frame a bit squarer to close up some gaps. Nevertheless, here's my mucked up version so you can see how it looks. I think the tinted acrylic looks quite handsome and matches the factory door. And like the earlier design, you can simply pull this off the top if you need more access. You're no doubt wondering which of these two designs is better at holding in heat. First things first, there is a chamber thermistor already built into the printer, labelled as temperature sensor cavity. There's also a cavity fan, we can control this directly from fluid, or set up g-code commands from the slicer, but for this experimentation I didn't use it at all. My test model was the handy Autodesk FDM test built right into Orca Slicer, and I chose black ASA for my filament. This model is chunky enough that it should promote some warping, but not so much that it's a torture test. Vanilla Orca Slicer sets the first layer bed temperature to 105, and I had to lower this to 100 to avoid this error. First up, the IKEA tub version, and starting with an ambient temperature of 28 degrees C, and around 10 minutes into the print, the chamber temp had reached 46 degrees, eventually stabilizing at around 55 to 56 degrees. After letting everything cool and switching to the second design, with some added tape to make sure the dummy fitted panels were sealing properly, the ambient temperature was 1 degree hotter at 29. I then ran the same G-code. 10 minutes in, the chamber temperature was again 46 degrees C, eventually stabilizing at 59 or 60 degrees C. We can also verify this on the cavity temperature graph in fluid. So the second version does run a few degrees hotter. I think this is partially explained by it being later in the day and therefore slightly warmer, but also because the IKEA tub looks to have a larger volume and uses thinner plastic too. You might recall me complaining in my first video that the bed is not super sticky if you're not using PLA. I verified that during this testing, having to cancel the first print because the ASA didn't really want to stick at all. You can see that the model did stick at first, but it is quite warped. For the second test, I did put on a lot of hairspray, but even so, this bed is just not suited for these type of filaments as the model came loose and peeled up, just about holding on until it finished. This print is completely untuned, so overall I think it looks pretty good. Those lumps on the side walls will disappear once the model remains stuck to a proper bed, as once the base fills up, the layers compress and cause these artifacts. So for me, these cheap top lids are definitely worth it, you just need a suitable bed to make the most of the modification. That is my testing done, and honestly I like both versions. They both have their pros and their cons. Let me know which of these, or perhaps whether you're holding out for the Snapmaker option, that you prefer down in the comments section. Thank you to Beaverworks and SRIN for their great designs. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.